One of the most dangerous aspects of the financial system are derivatives is not as simple as you think. You make grape juice by squeezing grapes. The juice is a derivative of the fruit itself, a secondary product made from the original. A financial derivative can literally be nothing tangible, nothing more than a formula, whether derivatives are a real thing. But behind all of this are bunches of debt packaged up, some rotting, some hanging on for your life. But in the end, we only see how bad things are as they fail. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. This has become my favorite topic, the commercial mortgage-backed securities, commercial real estate, of course, interconnected with it. What I talked about in the introduction here is very important to understand. A derivative is very difficult to know what's actually in it. A lot of times, as we found out during the financial crisis, there were things that should have never been allowed but yet they were i assure you the same thing is happening today but we have it really showing its ugly head right here in the commercial side and that is unfortunate for a lot of the businesses that are connected in with it i'm going to give you some details regarding this I'm going to talk about commercial real estate commercial mortgage-backed securities interest rates the central banks how they allow all this to happen look the rating agencies let this stuff occur they were all in on it rating triple a to things that were absolutely not triple a but because they considered it to be diversified think about all of the different types of debt that were in one of these tranches this is something that should never have been allowed but of course it was this is important because your home all of the banks that you associate with the lenders the businesses all of those big towers in your city are all connected to this through derivatives i want to hammer that home i need to get into this i got a lot of detail let's go i wanted to begin with this and you could see on the cover of barons you look at jerome powell being the hero essentially is what they're talking about it doesn't matter what happens here in the coming week all that's important is the federal reserve to the markets because as long as the markets continue to go up higher based on the fact that interest rates are really low and the federal reserve is printing money this is where you as an investor should have your focus don't worry about about all the other stuff all that matters is the federal reserve do you agree in this report, TREP examines how the commercial real estate, CRE, and commercial mortgage-backed security, CMBS, sectors are impacted by the global financial crisis in terms of delinquencies, spreads, losses, cumulative appraisal reduction amounts, and new structural and regulatory enhancements in how market conditions at the time compared to the current crisis here in 2020. So this is a really detailed report. Obviously, I'm not going to get into it all, but I definitely Definitely wanted to touch on the important points because this right here could absolutely be the pin that pops the bubble the real estate market is completely overvalued the primary indicator that i look at is what is the average person making and what does the average home costs that's the real estate side when we look at residential but we also have to factor in commercial. And today we are seeing a lot of the businesses that have been closing up shop. We are looking at, uh, that's on the retail side, but you see on the other side where we have a lot of businesses in this commercial space, the big towers and so on, where they've said bluntly, we do not need as many people at work. And so of course, there's going to be a lot of vacancies that vacancies put more pressure on these businesses as a whole when they're lending to th these type of corporations and of that it can't really uh, be a good thing for the commercial mortgage-backed securities. We know that. Commercial real estate market distress, what time frame are we looking at? For the CRE and CMBS sectors, the crisis right now of 2020 has had a broad-ranging disturbance with uh, effects rippling into the way we engage with others in social settings, how we work and interact with coworkers, how we travel, how we shop and buy groceries. Very true. You know that's the case. Obviously, everybody's dealing with this right now. And that has an impact. They talk about this here. Consequently, this issue of 2020 has accelerated existing commercial real estate trends in an increasingly digitalized world 
uh, such as the shifts away from the brick and mortar retail spurred by e-commerce growth, while also reversing other industry trends, at least in the near term, including a flight to less densely populated suburban areas. So right here, we got the rise of e-commerce, more people buying stuff online. So there's less need for all those JC pennies and the Sears and so on. And then you have people that are moving out of these really dense, you know, downtown environments because the boss said you can work from home permanently now. So they buy a place that's giving them more space. They now have a work from home scenario. Their office is there and they can can basically do do what they want but that has put additional pressure on these big buildings whereas we have uh, a situation in the suburbs where the prices have risen as a result the current market disruption has forced property owners to repurpose or find creative uses for space in malls and hotels that are expected to remain vacant for now to adapt to a changing and unpredictable uh, industry landscape. Obviously, this is going on and doesn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. Historical CMBS delinquency rates, great financial crisis versus the current 2020 crisis. And I just want to highlight the fact that you have to understand what happened last time and what's going on this time. As you can see here, multifamily had really risen throughout this period. And that is a very different scenario from what we have today. It barely moved up when we look at delinquencies this time around red by the way is multifamily last time around it was huge huge and you just see the difference with office having come up slightly but it is nowhere near what we have for retail and what we have for lodging essentially hotels these two are taking the biggest hit by far look if nobody's coming in you've got a big problem right during the great financial crisis, the distress took a notably longer time to play out as CMBS delinquencies and special servicing rates didn't reach their peak of 10% and 13% until mid-2012, several years after the start of the turmoil in 2008. And that's a good point, because if you look at what happened with the real estate market, you knew that there were problems in 2007, and then everything started to go crazy in 2008, but some aspects didn't get worse until years years later as it started to move through but you know right now today because of the moratoriums because of other issues as well this had really escalated dramatically in such a short period of time and the last part of this report, just seeing that by comparison, due to a near complete shutdown of parts of the economy earlier this year, lodging and retail became the two property segments that were immediately hit hard by mitigation policies, preventing travel and large social gatherings. This had hit them and you see it right on the chart. This culminated in the fastest rise in delinquency rates we've seen in CMBS history. That's why I'm talking about this. That's why this is so huge because of the impact here. The fastest rise, the biggest dent that will be experienced at least in these industries that we've ever seen before, okay? So that's just showing you that the 30 plus day delinquency rates hit a near all time high of 10% by June 2020. I'm just pointing this out here and you can see how many people have been moving out of New York, for instance, where you have different reasons, of course, maybe people they are allowed to work from home. So they're moving away. If they have the money, they're moving to the Hamptons. Others are moving to Maine. I've seen looking at this all over the place, but also you've got the corporate side and they don't necessarily need to be in Manhattan. They can move to areas that are cheaper, they're more affordable. And then you've got other that are getting way way out these uh, people with uh, more wealth and, and the corporations they're getting out of jersey they're getting out of new york and they're going to areas like florida and i completely understand why the taxation is simply too high they're being really stifled and so they are moving out and i think that this will continue there will be a continued trend because right now how do you pay for all of this the deficits had gotten much worse the debt has increased somebody's got to pay for it and with all the new programs that are being put in place, it looks like the only way is higher taxes. 
This is an article from the Financial Times. I just wanted to highlight one point before I move further into it. The SMP tallied 88 corporate bond defaults just in the second quarter of 2020, the highest since the peak of the financial crisis. Millions of smaller businesses have gone under. I note this because this is a problem that will get worse. They're telling you here in this article that you don't have to worry so much because it won't be as bad as last time around. But understand that this is all interconnected. If you take it at face value, this is kind of the way I look at information. So it comes in, there's an input here and you're viewing it and you could see the information here and you just move on this way, you are never going to be able to connect the dots. I always like to see it like this and you triangulate everything and you can figure it out because the actual questions are in between all of this data that you have to piece together. This is not a tangent. I'm trying to explain specifically that when we look at commercial mortgage-backed securities, there are all these different nuances to it. And if you're just focusing on one thing, you'll never see what's actually happening. That's why this is so key. Global credit worthiness has atrophied since the 1990s. This is the number of S&P non-financial credit ratings by grade. And you've got to look at it for yourself on here, but just see how there's the AAA, AA, and so on. And where we have seen the growth is not exactly in the best territories. That's for sure. I mean, the triple B, for instance, which is one that I've talked about quite a bit since the 90s has really expanded. As you can see here, it is not a good sign because as I've noted many, many times before, you have this triple B and if the rating happens to be downgraded, which has happened already, and, and of course will go into a, a much worse rating, and it becomes junk, if it moves into that territory of junk, then many of the funds are unable to hold it. If that occurs, you have a cascade of selling, and that's why the Federal Reserve stepped in, and there's actually part of their, you know, they call these the, the fallen angels. They are are specifically buying some of these funds that are, are in need of the debt that is in need of this buyout because otherwise there'll be nobody else there to support it. They have talked about this publicly. It's not something that is hidden from the public or anything like that. You could see it for yourself. I have shown you the documentation from the Federal Reserve. They make it very clear and it is so key to understand. In this article here out of the Financial Times, they are referencing this MNM theorem. And without getting into too much detail, they are talking about debt, okay? Their initial findings only held in a world without frictions such as taxes, imperfect information, and inefficient markets, but a later revisitation that incorporated the tax deductibility enjoyed by interest payments showed that the value of an indebted company is actually higher than that of an unleveraged one. It helped the, uh, the, the intellectual groundwork for dramatic erosion of corporate credit worthiness. Now, isn't that interesting? When you look at the companies today, I'm going to pull it out again, as I always do. Apple. Apple is one company. They're worth $2 trillion plus. And you can see that this company here takes on debt. They issue debt, by the way, that is bought by the Federal Reserve, an absolutely ridiculous policy. But what's the point of this? What's the point? Well, as they discuss here, this is all part of the way that the system works. It's built upon debt, and so they use it accordingly. That's why individuals use it in their business, as it says here, tax deductibility. That's part of it. They know that the leverage factor is another thing. So these businesses don't, doesn't matter how big they are. They are always using the maximum amount of debt that they can. That's all for this video. If you found it informative, hit that thumbs up by clicking the like button on your screen. You support me. Thank you very much.
If you are interested in e-commerce, you want to know about what's happening with all of the online sales and everything to do with that, I teach you in my course for free, the AmazonGPS.com. Have you seen my two books? I break down everything you need to know right here very easily. Definitely check them out. You can uh, get it in the description or if you want the audiobook instead, TheMoneyGPS.com. Hang on a second, don't go anywhere. Have you seen this video right here? A lot of detail. I get into so much. Definitely watch it if you haven't already. Click it. I'll see you there.